Larger Than Life, 20 Short Stories by Xavier Herbert. Sequel to a Song The leasings of Bamboo Creek had long been convinced that their manifold misfortunes were due to occult conjuration. They also believed they knew the conjurer, a native soothsayer named Pandark, whom they had antagonized. Pandark, like most medicine men, a wanderer, not belonging to the local aboriginal tribe, but attached to them for, for the while, had made himself a nuisance to the leasings by presuming that because they were not entirely white, they should defer to him as the blacks did. Not that the leasings were unduly proud in their measure of whiteness. Indeed, they were the simplest and most easygoing of folk. They were not simply a mixture of black and white, but had a strong dash of Chinese. People of such breed are usually of much happier disposition than most mixed bloods, perhaps because they inherit some element from the Chinese side which tends toward complacence. However, it was just too much even for the leasings to have that stringy, dirty, cheeky old scarecrow moving in on them with his opium smoking and his noisy mumbo-jumbo and his swag of fearful and smellful paraphernalia that included mummified bits of human remains. Perhaps the leasings would not have minded Pandark as a guest so much, seeing they were, there, they were so many, three generations of them all swarming through the multitudinous rooms of the rambling old homestead of Bamboo Creek Station, that masterpiece of Chinese jerry building, but Pandark upset the local blacks with his doctor business, just when their help was needed for the big effort of the year, a muster of cattle for trucking to Darwin. It was on this annual sale of stock for export that the simple but sound economy of the leasings depended. Their pro property was small, but they ran it with the same Chinese thrift and thoroughness as had characterized its conduct ever since its foundation by the original Li Sing, a full Chinese, long since gathered to his ancestors who, from mining on the Golden Gully Goldfield, came down to settle in the lush plains country and took unto himself a half-caste bride, she a Eurostralian, to found a dynasty. Old Willie Leasing, son of the founder and present pater familias, tried to get rid of Pandark, the soothsayer, courteously enough, in the first place, by making him a generous gift of clothes, tobacco, and rations for the road, while suggesting that he would want to be on his way now that everybody else about the place was going to be busy. Old Pandark took the gifts, but promptly turned them into cash with a deal in the black's camp, then went off to buy opium from a Chinaman in the township of Golden Gully and came back to do his smoking in that corner he had annexed for himself in the leasing homestead. To subsequent more pointed request to leave, following on trouble he made among the natives, he bluntly declared that he could not go until his doctor, Bijnich, medicine man business, was properly concluded. The leasings continued to suffer him until roused one midnight by loud disputation in the house between him and another old black fellow over opium. Then they ordered him off the premises in no uncertain terms. Pandark defied them, declaring that he would make big trouble for them if not treated with due respect. 
Thereupon they threw him out, bag and stinking baggage. According to the natives, Pendark, before leaving the neighborhood, performed the ceremony of singing by which, with appropriate incantation, it is supposed that one may set to work supernatural forces to gain one's ends, particularly in the way of getting even with one's enemies. The Leesings only laughed, saying, Gairn, don't give us that black feller business. However, such was the sequel as to have shaken the realism of even the hardest-headed of materialists. Hence, it was not long before they came to greet each new calamity as it assaulted their fortunes with the wholeheartedness of those convinced that their luck is out, crying, Yeah, we been sung all right. A week after the alleged singing, the stock inspector came to Bamboo Creek Station to make the usual examination of the cattle mustered for export. He found the beasts suffering with a disease that not only caused him to declare them unfit for sale, but to place the entire herd under quarantine. The fact that no other cattle save the leasings were affected by the disease was surely but logical consequence of the official promptitude in isolating them. However, that was not how the circumstance was generally regarded. Not that the idea of the leasings having been sung by Pandark would be taken seriously by many. Still, it was enough to speak of their run of misfortunes to have most people class them as unfortunates doomed to ill luck and everything. Doomed was right it seemed. Business people they dealt with, mostly Chinese, who set much store on luck, came to distrust their ability to meet their commitments. Thus, their credit was progressively restricted as their need of it increased. Such was the cumulative effect that at the time this tale begins, which was just three years after their falling foul of Pandark, their bankruptcy and subsequent dispossession of all that had been labored for by three generations of them was considered a foregone conclusion. Now, while the leasings accepted the idea that they were being harried by malevolent forces, the fact had not caused them to abandon all endeavor, as for a certainty it would have had they been more aboriginal of heritage. They were too much t Chinese not to keep on striving in adversity. They spent the first season of the ban on the sale of their cattle nursing the herd, using remedies supplied by the stock department, as well as fantastic concoctions from Chinese herbalists, they were all utterly ineffectual. The next season they sought to stabilize their toppling economy by removing the unproductive herd from the most fertile areas of their run and putting these to crop with peanuts. At the time, peanuts were fetching a high price. So propitious were the indi indications of a bumper crop that they involved themselves still more financially with the purchase of implements. They brought the crop almost to the point of harvesting when suddenly it was eaten out by a species of nitrogen-seeking beetle that previously had lived only on gross beneath the dung of the cattle they had removed. The next season, they turned their efforts to buffalo shooting. If anything betrayed the desperateness of their economic condition, it was this. In recent years, with leather at a premium throughout the world, the water buffaloes of North Australia had been hunted for their massive hides so thoroughly that no human had a hope of getting within the long range of the noses of those surviving. The buffaloes were still plentiful enough, but had vanished from the plains and had taken to the swamps. Docile as dogs, as such creatures may have been when bred in captivity, in the feral state, at least, as they are found in Australia, there is no animal to match them in ferocity, 
vengefulness, cunning, and hatred of mankind. To go into the swamps after them, into the tangles of pandanus, paper bark, and mile upon mile of bullgrass was regarded as an act of sheer recklessness, something that adventurous spirits might do occasionally for the sheer thrill of it. Only a white man would do that sort of thing. The blacks went mostly in terror of the gray monsters. Chinamen also having mostly too much savvy to take risk unless they promised to pay, well, very cherry of the wild buffalo. So the leasings were the last people to be expected to go into the swamps. The venture involved them in further expenditure on new rifles and ammunition and other equipment and a great quantity of that expensive commodity of the region, salt. It lasted long enough to lay up half the males of the family with swamp fever, leech rash, and barku rot. Later they took two such lowly pursuits as the cutting and splitting of bamboo and searching for the rare local ebony used by the Chinese for carving occupations usually left to the blacks. Finally, they took to pig hunting. This was to meet the demand of the Chinese community for the New Year festivities. Rather, it was to corner the market in New Year pigs, for this service was also left usually to camp blackfellows who would catch a few sucking pigs and keep them as pets until the Chinese came round to the camps to buy them. Pigs were plentiful enough, but even harder to come by than buffaloes, because they had to be taken alive and of certain size, but the leasings went to it with the thoroughness of their Chinese instincts and the urge of their desperate conditions. To be sure, they kept looking for the catch in the seeming success of the venture of the pigs convinced as they were of their lucky lucklessness. When it happened, they actually had their great haul of young porkers in the stockyard ready for transport by wagon <clears throat> to the railway siding, where three stock cars waited that would be picked up by the afternoon train going through to Darwin. The family were at midday dinner in the long, low-roofed corrugated iron and stringy bark kitchen, the mob of them with their male bellowing and female chattering and infantile squealing, making noise enough to cause precious seconds to be lost before any of them became aware of the piggy uproar that signaled the disaster. When they got out to sea, pigs were everywhere. In the lead of the rush to stop the debacle, Old Willie was cut down by a phalanx of flying pigs. All the pigs got away because of diversion of the family's attention to Grandpa, who was picked up senseless and with his arm obviously broken. In fact, Grandpa suffered a fractured skull in that episode. He regained consciousness in the hospital in Darwin to find the family around him and to learn that every blessed pig but one had escaped, the single exception having been swallowed by the rock python whose intrusion into the stock stockyard had caused the piggy panic. As usual now, whenever misfortune smote them, his comment was, we be we been sung all right. Now, for all that had been seen or heard of him, who was supposed to have done the singing, he, old Pandark, might have spirited himself out of existence. The leasings had long concluded that the only way to get rid of the jinx they labored under was to placate the Arthur of it, to which end they had made many inquiries, letting it be known that it would be greatly to his advantage to show up again at Bamboo Creek. As a medicine man, Pendark suffered no restriction on movement.
through others' tribal territories. Thus he wandered where he willed, peddling his hocus-pocus wherever blackfellows were to be found over a million square miles of country. He might not turn up again for years, perhaps never again. There is a limit even to Chinese cheerfulness and adversity. The leasings reached it with the disaster of the pigs, their state of dejection in the beginning of what would be the fourth year of their misery was rendered complete with the setting in of the monsoonal rains. The frailer members of the family got out of some of it by succumbing to one or more of the many wet season maladies and going up to join grandpa in hospital for a spell. The others had to sit it out on the damp ant bed floored verandas at home, staring into the ever-hanging silver curtains of the rain. It was about a month after the rains had passed that one day, while Grandpa and most of his sons and some of their sons were lounging in the front veranda, awaiting the call to the meager dinner the women were preparing in the kitchen, staring in silence across the verdant landscape with its shimmering silver billabongs and cobalt fringe of hills, they became aware that they had a visitor, one who had come to them around the house so silent-footed that he might have materialized for them then and there, as they seemed to think, to judge by their astonishment. He was a skinny old black fellow clad in a filthy woolen cardigan and red loincloth with gray hair caught up in a pipe-clayed fillet. The falling ends of his hair twisted into locks fixed with grease and clay in the style of the aboriginal wise man. In one hand he held a woomera, arms of a man on a peaceful mission, while from the other dangled a brace of dead Ashidna, surely a peace offering. He showed tobacco blackened stumps of teeth in a grin, saying, Good day. They gasped in chorus, Pandark, although they stopped short of leaping on him in joyous greeting. There was no doubt about their pleasure in seeing him. He lent his old head to one side in shrewd contemplation of the grinning group. Whatever his powers, it was obvious that he did not realize how much sway he held here, else he never would have presented himself so amiably. He held out his gift, saying, You want? I'm porcupine. The Ashindana were taken eagerly and rushed to the kitchen to augment the midday meal. Old Pendark shared the meal, not at table with the family, but in the comfort he was used to, squatting cross-legged out on the back veranda in what had been his favorite spot for eating. He vanished after dinner, but was back again before supper with his smellful swag. Without seeking permission, he dumped it in his favorite corner of the rambling old house. After supper, he disappeared again to return with the setting of the young moon, as announced by the homestead dogs, and retired. Next morning, he came to the kitchen with two more porcupines, saying, Dut, Dr. Bijnich, I can catch um, anything you like. Too good me. Whatever old Pendark's method of filling his bag, it was something he had picked up since last in these parts, because he had shown so little ability in providing for himself formally as to be always importunate in the matter of food. Still, no one dared to question him. But early the second night, when they heard him go out, they peeped. There he went in the moonlight down towards the timber of the creek, carrying over his shoulder a long dilly bag containing something so smellful that the dogs were following him 
in a leaping, snifling pack. He beat off the dogs with the only thing he carried, his Woomera. Again Pendark returned at moonset, this time with a live catch, one that added shrill squealing to the din of the dogs as he humped it along on a pole from which it hung by its haunches. The household turned out to receive him and the fat little pig he offered. To their further astonishment at his prowess was added that of finding that the pig bore the earmark declaring it to be one of those they had caught and lost. When they told Pendark about the lost pigs, he said in that superior way of his, Spone, spose you want em, I catch em you back dat you lot piggy pig. They gaped at him, yeah? How much you pay em me? Grandpa said, anything you like, Malacca o man. Pandark cupped his hands and extended them in the way of the old-time black fellow, asking the maximum reward for service. You fill him up silver. I fill him up silver for you, Malacca. All right. The household leapt into activity again for the first time for so long. Fat young pigs were always sellable and only too well did they know that there were plenty of them about, and how could there be anything but success and another venture with the creatures when the very person who could make or mar their fortunes was now sharing the same. The method decided upon by which they would get their pigs was to be a combination of the crude one used by the leasings with Pendark's finesse. The leasing's method was to set traps of pig netting on the pig runs in the swamps and to beat up their quarry, which usually ran in family groups. With the help of dogs, they would extract from the traps those of their captives that were of suitable size and subsequently free the others. It worked occasionally. All pigs are wary birds and big pigs more than apt to violence if roused. What Pendark would do exactly, he would not disclose. He only said that they could have no dogs along with him, would not need to do any beating, and must work by night. In fact, all he required of them was to set up a single trap and to handle the pigs he would lure into it. They set out for the swamps in the afternoon of that same day. All of the grown male leasings with Pendark riding in a low hung wagon drawn by two horses. Pendark had with him that long dilly bag containing the pungent stuff, which stuff was rendered still more odorous by reason of his now keeping it concealed inside the filthy cardigan against his body. The others sat as far from him as possible, and some even got out and walked. It was a curious stench, ammoniacal, yet Swedish. Perhaps from some kind of musk, a hunting lure used by some far aboriginal tribe he had met in his recent wanderings. Pendark directed them to set up the trap so that the region of swamp they intended to work lay downwind from them. This was, of course, the very converse of usual hunting practice, by which one is at pains not to let the quarry get one cent. His purpose was revealed only when he began his operations in the moonlit dusk. At the back of the trap he built a fire with pandanus nuts and pipes that soon became a heap of glowing coals. <clears throat> Next, he mixed his musky stuff with something else from the dilly bag, fat or soft wax or other inflammable substance of some of the kind. Then, of the mixture, he took a small piece, rolled it into a pellet, and muttering some kind of gibberish, flung it into the fire. After a moment, the pellet exploded with a flash, emitting a puff of dense white vapor, that even while the bulk of it floated away in a little cloud 
on the evening breeze still disseminated in invincible molecules enough of its pungence to cause the pop-eyed audience to withdraw somewhat, blinking and sniffling. After an interval, Pandark rolled another pellet and flung it in with the muttered incantation, and then another and another. First response to the allurement, it spread abroad, was from a brace of little bats that, flinging themselves, twittering madly, into a puff of the incense as it rose, were overcome and fell into the fire. Next came various rodents and small marsupials, whose fear of the fire held them back from disaster, but which scampered about in excited state so long as the business continued. The first pig arrived within an hour, a lone fat little fellow bearing the earmark. He was surprisingly docile when snatched out of the trap and dumped in the wagon. A bevy of three more earmarked porkers followed, which also put up no such riotous performance as might be expected, soon to prove that the docility of the earliest captives was not due simply to their having been handled before was the behavior of the clean skins that followed them. The first of these were a large family, comprising huge sire and dam, and their offspring of a couple of seasons, no less than five of which went into the wagon. The bag for the night, or rather for the six or so hours during which the supply of pigs lasted, was twenty-seven, as much as the leasings would have expected to get in a week by their own poor means. The excitement ended with the setting of the moon about midnight. Obviously all pigs within limits of the lure's effectiveness had been taken. They were home soon after sunrise to be received with jubilation by the rest of the family. The pigs were put into the stockyard now with a double security of wire netting around them and a constant guard to watch for pythons. There was no talk now of having been sung. Next night's operations conducted in another part of the swampland looked like being still more successful with 15 young pigs in the bag within two hours, while yet the run showed no sign of abatement, but then the wind changed from south to east to blow away from the swamp out across a stretch of plain. Uselessly, it seemed, since the lure brought in nothing from that quarter save a couple of bandicots and a white-tailed rat. At least that was all it brought in while they remained in that spot. The really tremendous bag it was luring, while seeming to dissipate uselessly over the apparently empty plain, was not revealed to them till they themselves, hoping to get a few more pigs while the moon was up, ventured out across the plain in the wake of those molecules of magic. They were heading for Swampland, they knew lay a couple of miles across the plain to westward downwind. They had been traveling about half an hour, packed in the wagon of, with the pigs, were about halfway across the plain when the horses halted, snorting, tossing heads, then made a unanimous decision to turn for home. <clears throat> A couple of the younger boys leapt down to hold the horses' heads. The boys saw the cause of the horses' alarm. Several ghostly bovine faces, low-hanging under enormous horns, were peering from the grass. The boys turned in their tracks, yelling, Bufflers! Aloud their heads, the horses wheeled the wagon in its length and thundered away with it back along the track they had just made tumbling their passengers and cargo into a shouting, screaming heap. Not that there was need for such precipitousness. It was ascertained after they had covered a wild half-mile or so, and the winded horses tangled with a clump of pandanus, and stopped that the buffaloes were not in pursuit, at least not closely. Evidently the buffaloes had not been waiting in ambush, or they most certainly would have charged the boys on the ground at sight. 
This idea occurred to the Leesings, as with passing of danger, they fell to discussing the incident. Then they argued why had the beasts not fled before their noisy approach, as invariably the kind did unless in vengeful mood. Assuming that they had come upon a handful of beasts that had not had dealings with men, they came at last to expressing regret that they had been in such a hurry to avoid them, that they hadn't got the rifle out and added a buffalo hide or two to the night's takings. Nevertheless, they continued on their homeward way. It was on young Barney, always the one for ideas, that the truth of the situation first dawned. They were then back at the spot where they had taken the night's pigs, Barney suggested. Reckon them bufflers might have been coming after the smoke, same's the pigs, eh? The others were staggered by the idea. There was a general murmur over it. Might have been two cripes, what you reckon, eh? They put it to Pendark, who declared, I've been tellin', tell em, you, no matter anything, I can catch em. Old Willie asked, how about you catch em, dat lot buffler for me? Spoon, you pay em, you pay em me big. I pay you big, all right, mulaka. So they alighted there beside the still glowing fire. Pandark stirred up the fire, rolled some more of his magic pellets, and set his bijnich in operation. In operation. The result shocked even the magician himself, who at its revelation rushed to the wagon and jumped in with the pigs. The others stood for a moment transfixed. Converging on them from the west was what looked like a solid wall of buffaloes. It was fortunate that the horses were facing the other way and into the wind, <clears throat> or, they, <clears throat> or they would surely <clears throat> have been off like a shot with Pandark leaving the leasings behind. As it was, the horses turned only to ascertain the cause of the second and greater rush of the leasings. Then the horses bolted. Again, when the horses knocked up, it was found that there was no need for panic. Then the leasings began to bewail the fact that they had only one rifle with them and that the moon was almost down. But as they agreed, even with all their rifles, in broad daylight, they would be able to get only a handful of the buffaloes, because as soon as the shooting started, the mob, the mob would stampede. Old Willie groaned, I never see so many buffler. Cripes, Spone, we got em, that lot in a paddock, eh? It was just wishing, since it was simply impossible to round up and yard wild buffaloes. But that lively brain of young Barney's was working. Reckon we can make that lot fuller smoke right back the homestead and run em into Bullock Paddock and shoot em deer, yet? They cried in chorus, yeah, yeah, how about it, Grandpa? Old Willie said, <clears throat> what about wind? But she ain't blowing right. Barney had it all worked out. Reckon we can cart smoke. Longa ten, eh? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Where ten? They made a brazier of their large billy can, set a fire in it, put Pendark to doing his stuff. It meant they had to go back for the buffaloes. They did so very warily with a couple of scouts, John, Johnny and Charlie, out ahead. The buffaloes were where they had left them, but within a few minutes the effect of the lure was felt, and the instinct, indistinct gray mass milling about the remains of the fire, snuffling and grumbling, began to move towards the wagon. It began decorously enough as a procession, however panic could not help but arise again, with that ghostly herd at heel, invisible now, save as a cloud of dust, faintly silvered by the set moon's afterglow, but the persistence of its pursuit only too evident in the dull thunder of great hoofs. 
the crash of small trees torn down by great horns, that too eager snuffling and deep-throated grumbling. Soon the pace was a trot. The going was easier now because they were on the road. There was less than a mile to go. Then they were galloping. The plan was for Johnny and Charlie to drop off as they came up to the bullock paddock and sprint ahead to open the gate then to get clear and wait till the buffaloes came through and shut the gate behind them. The boys dropped off bravely enough and flung the gate open for the wagon, but they lost their nerve as the wagon went through without them and raced after it and leapt, leapt back aboard. Anyway, there would have been no sense in their staying behind, judging by the twanging of the wires of the wrecked fence as the thundering herd came through. The terrible thing now was that the buffaloes were not being lured, or so it seemed, for the fire can had been upset by the rough going well before the gate was reached, and Pandark had been down in the bottom of the wagon with the pigs ever since. It was then, as they went with their bolting horses, through the gathering darkness across the bullock paddock, heading for the gate of the home paddock and the refuge of home, that the truth of the situation dawned on them, first voiced by someone who howled above the racket of their going, "'Day ain't fullerin' us. Day's chasin' us.' Those brave boys, Johnny and Charlie, leapt down again to open the home paddock gate as the horses slid to haunches before it and they stayed to shut the gate on the shouted instructions of the lesser men still in the wagon. They shut it almost in the ghostly faces of the pursuers, then turned and ran the couple of hundred yards to home, surely to break all records. The buffaloes crashed into the gate, and in bringing it down fell in a monstrous heaving heap. The women and children of the family Roused by the uproar of the dogs and the thunderous homecoming, came rushing out on the veranda, a couple with lanterns, all screaming questions, to which the answer was a single word, yelled in chorus as the men kept from the wagon. <clears throat> Bufflers. In a moment, the answer was verified by the rush of cloven hoofs and the rising storm of that snuffling and grumbling. The horses bolted with the wagon and the shrilling pigs. The humans melted into the house, most of them crowding into the kitchen and slammed the doors. In the kitchen, it was almost immediately discovered why the buffaloes had kept coming, apparently without the lore. The lore had been operating all right, but of its own accord, burning in Pandark's dilly bag, which must have been set smoldering by the fire spilled in the wagon. The pungent smoke surrounded old Pendark, like the reeking effluvium of a demon. The others yelled at him when he began a gingerly inspection of his property instead of making haste to get rid of it. The others tried to grab it from him. He fought them off, jabbering in his lingo. Crash! Attention was snatched from Pendark to the back door. A great black horn was protruding through it. Crash! The door came out of its frame, advanced a yard inward, then with a jerk leapt off the horn and smashed into the great laden dresser, bringing down a cascade of glass and china. The watchers had eyes only for the owner of the horn, whose broad, scaly head, sparsely covered with lank black hair, hung in the doorway, drooping under its weight of horn, blinking great luminous eyes in the lamplight, flaring cavernous nostrils, snuffling, dribbling, deeply rumbling. The buffalo wanted to come in, but was prevented by his other horns by his other horn still outside, his horn span being easily twice that of the doorway. He strove off for a moment, while the humans 
goggled. Then, with a jerk, he pulled down half the back wall. Crash. The humans yelled and shrieked and drew back to crouch in masses, hard by the other doors, now goggling beyond the snuffling intruder at the gray-packed mass of horned heads, blinking in at them from the back veranda. Even as they watched, one of the beasts getting a horn caught by a post of the low veranda, as they moved forward, put his tonnage into freeing himself, brought the flimsy iron and sapling roof down on himself and his mates. Then the snorting, head-tossing mass moved into the kitchen. Howling their terror, the humans moved out into the other rooms, out onto the front veranda. The cry went up. They knockin' the house down, we goin's be killed. Get the rifles. <clears throat> then above the babble rose Grandpa's voice. Stockyard, stockyard, everybody come stockyard. Yeah, yeah, stockyard, they can't get us there. Where Granny, where Ruby, where little hooky Pandark, where that old man Pandark had vanished. The others gathered themselves together, set out in a mob for the high-railed stockyard, the bulk of which was faintly silhouetted against the blaze of the southern stars, only a hundred yards or so away. As they went, one of the children screeched, Look it, look it, fire! The rush stopped. The back part of the house was ablaze, set alight by the lamp overturned in the kitchen. They all raised their voices and started back to deal with the new calamity. But then the buffaloes came crashing through the flimsy walls out to the front of the house. The leasings turned and fled. Such was the rush to the stockyard that no one thought of the pigs shut up there. Those in the lead fell over the pigs. The pigs went mad, found the open gate, decamped in a screaming mass. Not, not that the loss of those few pigs could mean mu anything much. Now, in a matter of minutes, their home was blazing from end to end. They stood in silence watching. This was surely the end of them as the leasings of Bamboo Creek. For a certainty had they been sung and remained unsung for all the seeming friendliness of the alleged author of their vast misfortune. Where was that alleged author of it all? Had he spirited himself away again after accomplishing their utter ruination? No, there he was suddenly before them, a skinny silhouette against the blaze, still clutching his dilly bag, racing from the house with a black mass galloping on his heels, a mass of tossing horns and rumps and high-flung tails. Pendark saw the stockyard as refuge, swung towards it, but the buffaloes swung too, their flank stringing out to head him off. He swung again. Now before him was the carcass hoist, on which beast killed for home consumption were butchered, a kind of windlass rigged on post some twelve feet above the ground, with long poles to turn it like spokes of a wheel. He leapt behind it, clung to it, to the wires that bound the spokes. The buffaloes, crowding in, set the spokes moving. As if by magic he claimed to work, he was raised above the milling beast. But it was not magic, as if on a great wheel he was carried over the top, upside down, and swung down again, hollering back into the mass of horns that tossed him up again, up and over, and down again, and up again. Then the hoist collapsed with a twanging of snapped wire and crack of broken wood in the tangle of which Pendark bit the dust. The collapse sent the buffalo scampering back a bit, nonplussed them for a moment. Pendark seized his opportunity, leapt up with the astonishing agility he was capable of in emergency, and raced away into the night. A moment, then the buffaloes were after him. That he beat them to the home paddock fence was told by the terrific twang of the herds going through. The Wire but how the race went after that was anybody's guess. The thunder of it passed out of earshot. 
Then there was no sound in the land, save those of the destruction of the leasing's home and hopes. Soon the house crumbled into a glowing heap. While the leasings watched, most, most of them through tears, at length even the glow died, and there was nothing to see but the stars beyond the emptiness. The women and children cried themselves to sleep, huddled together in that stinking pig pen. The older boys saw most of the sights the night through with Grandpa, Willie, sitting most silent, brooding, wondering each to himself what occasionally they asked one another. What we gonna do now, eh? Old Willie was the one awake when day dawned. He rose silently from the midst of his family and stole away from them to taste of the initial bitterness alone, came to the ruin of the house of his father and of his children and his children's children. As the light grew from standing staring, old Willie moved amongst the ruins, perhaps to see what had survived. He came to the kitchen, picking his way through the litter, and stopped to contemplate the wreck of that very center of any home. The hearth collapse of the homemade brick wall thereabout had upset the cast iron stove, which had split open in falling. His attention was caught by the glint in the riven brick base on which the stove had stood. He bent to see, to touch, to grasp and drew forth something softly shining in his dusky hand. He started in astonishment. What he held was a small bar of smelted gold, a home-cast ingot of the kind in which illegal gold was handled in the roaring mining days. Exclaiming with excitement, he tore away the debris to reveal a wooden box, a foot or so in length by half in breadth, of which the lid was rotted. He tried to lift it out of the cavity. It was too heavy. He broke away the lid, grasped a handful of the shiny rods it was packed with, raised it, marveling at the sight and feel and weight. For a certainty, the history of that hoard would be discreditable because the early Chinese were the trickiest gold dealers of all, but whatever its history, it would have been long forgotten. Now it was the rightful property of the leasing dynasty, doubtless a secret bequest from the dead founder, who had not dared even to hint at its existence, but only to anticipate with Chinese patience and sanguinity its eventual possession by those for whom he had schemed to get it, his progeny chief of whom in this time Willie now raised his eyes from it, and turning towards the stockyard, raised his voice so that it rang through the land. Hey everybody, come look, everybody, come quick. Bad luck, I'm finish, finish. Sure enough, that was the end of that strange run of misfortune, supposed to be sequel to a song. The reputation for irremediable lucklessness the leasings had suffered so long was forgotten the instant news of the gold find got abroad. Whether or not the news had anything to do with the lifting of the quarantine on their stock, it certainly did have the effect of bringing the stock inspector down to Bamboo Creek earlier than he would have come ordinarily, because he wanted to hear of the find for himself, and he did lift the band forthwith. What happened to the alleged author of it all, no one ever knew. For sure, the buffaloes never caught old Pendark, or his remains would have been found. It was presumed by those who wondered about his escape that he had effected it by magic. These also hoped that he had done it so thoroughly as to have betaken himself beyond the likelihood of ever coming back.